In this topic, we'll discuss increased intracranial pressure. Increased intracranial pressure is the pressure within the skull. It is normally between 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Above 15 millimeters of mercury, we consider that increased. When it's above 20, it's considered a medical emergency that requires interventions. Increased intracranial pressure is regulated by the brain's blood, the brain's tissue, and CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is made in the ventricles and it goes through the brain and around the brain covering and then it goes into the spinal cord and it's a continuous infusion. Whenever we have uh, inter increased intracranial pressure, that means we are going to disrupt the cerebral perfusion pressure. The cerebral perfusion pressure is how much pressure is within the brain and how it perfuses with blood and oxygen and nutrients. So when one volume of one structure, either the brain's blood, tissue, or cerebral spinal fluid is increased or swollen, that means another structure, one of the three, will decrease. Cerebral perfusion pressure is normal between 60 and 100 millimeters of mercury. Now let's look at our signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. So the very first symptom you're going to see is a decrease in the level of consciousness. So this is the one you want to pick out early so that you can intervene. So a decreased level of consciousness is anything that is different than how they normally were. So they start to have confusion or they become extremely tired and have lethargy or they become restless and irritable. So those are changes in uh, mental status, a decrease in level of consciousness. So the changes in mental status and decreased level of consciousness, those are the things you want to look out for early, especially after like a head injury or something like that. So you ever heard of someone say, oh, don't fall asleep after you hit your head? Okay, because we want to monitor for a decrease in level of consciousness. And if you fall asleep, after, right after a head injury, that definitely could be indicative of some increased intracranial pressure. So we want to watch out for those changes. Okay, next would be vomiting and headache. So as the pressure within the skull increases, it pressures on those sensors that make someone want to vomit. So vomiting and then headache, um, slurred speech, so changes in your speech, um, very slow to react. Those also go along with, cha with changes in your level of consciousness, the slurred speech. And the next one is papilledema. Papilledema is a swelling in the eye and it can cause slugg sluggish and unequal pupils. So really slow to move. So if you are doing your, um, your perla assessment and you've got your pin light and you're flicking and seeing if the the pupils constrict, they would be very slow to constrict, or they may be unequal. So as the swelling in the brain happens, it may not be equal in the brain. So you may only see one eye bigger and the other eye smaller, the other pupil smaller, so they'll be unequal. Now let's look at some late signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. Doll's eyes is a normal reflex that a comatose person has who does not have brain damage. So as you turn the patient's head to the left, the eyes go to the right, or vice versa. It's the brain's ability to try and fixate on an object for vision. However, in a patient who has a brain injury and they have brain damage happening, they may have a negative or absence doll's eye reflex. So in general, the doll's eye's reflex is a normal reflex like this, but if there is trouble, a negative reflex or an absence reflex is when the eyes go with the head. Okay, the next one is seizures and posturing. So with posturing, you may see decebrid and decorticate posturing. That is because of the lack of oxygen in the brain. Loss of gag reflexes and corneal reflex. So the corneal reflex is when you take a little uh, maybe piece of cotton and you wisp it next to the eyelid and the eye should blink. So that will be absent on someone who has late symptoms. Um, apnea and Cheyenne Stokes respiration. So as the patient starts to deteriorate, you may start to see the Cheyenne Stokes respirations where it's really irregular and they're kind of gasping for breath and there's not regular and it has some apnea. 
The uh, other thing you'll see in the late signs and symptoms is Cushing's triad. Cushing's triad is easy to remember because it's the opposite of hypovolemic shock symptoms. So the opposite of shock. So that would mean a decrease in heart rate, an increase in systolic blood pressure, and irregular respirations, which also could be uh, Cheyenne Stokes respirations. Now with the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure is rising because of the decrease in blood flow that the brain is getting because of the pressure. So in response, the body tries to increase the pressure of the systolic contraction and tries to push more blood up into the brain, which actually makes things worse because we're, it already has a lot of pressure and although we're not getting good blood flow to the brain, as the body tries to raise that blood pressure and pushes the blood back up into the brain, it causes the brain to be worse and filled with more pressure. So that will make symptoms worse. So it's really a downhill slope once they start getting to the vital sign changes. So what you really need to remember with this topic is monitoring for changes in mental status in a decreased level of consciousness. So now let's look at some treatment options for these patients. So the first thing you want to do is treat the cause. If they've had a brain injury and they need relief pressure, maybe they'll make burr holes in the side of the skull to help relieve some of the pressure from the swelling. It just depends on what's going on, but we definitely want to try and treat the cause. That's going to be the physician's job to manage that part. Um, we also will maintain normal blood pressure. So we don't want their blood pressure to be low or high. We want to maintain normal blood pressure. And we'll do that when we give isotonic fluids. So that way we won't increase um, uh, tissue or, or vascular fluids by giving dextrose or whatnot. So we will just give plain isotonic fluids. Um, next, we'll prevent hypoxia. So hypoxia and then uh, maintaining the carbon dioxide levels between 30 and 35, that's the normal level, because these patients, when they have cerebral vasodilation, it makes their carbon dioxide levels go up. So what we want to do is hyperventilate the patient. When we hyperventilate the patient, we can bring their carbon dioxide levels down, so blow off more carbon dioxide as faster that they're exhaling, so they're breathing in and out more, and that will help decrease the pressure in the brain. So we want to do that. We want to keep them in normal vital signs. And when we want to prevent hypoxia, because as that carbon dioxide level rises, we don't want changes in their oxygen saturation. We'll also prevent hyperthermia. So hyperthermia in a hotter body creates vasodilation. So vasodilation is something that will increase the pressure in the brain. So we don't want to have hyperthermia. So let's look at some medications that we're going to use to help manage the increased intracranial pressure. We'll first give mannitol. Mannitol is a drug of choice that is an osmotic diuretic. So what it does, it inhibits the reabsorption of sodium and that means that where sodium goes, water follows. So they can excrete more water through their urine. We decrease the amount of fluid in their body and it helps decrease their blood pressure and therefore decreases the pressure in their skull. Next is corticosteroids, and the drug of choice for this one is Decadron. So corticosteroids will help reduce swelling and pressure within the brain. Anticonvulsants are given to help prevent seizures, and Dilantin is usually the drug that they choose to use. So an anticonvulsant is to help prevent any sort of seizure. So that activity of a seizure can there in itself increase the pressure within the brain. Next is phenobarbital. Phenobarbital is also for seizure activity and it can be used for sedation. So phenobarbital has two uh, properties that it can be used for, so it just depends on how the physician wants to use this medication. The other one is benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are given for sedation and anxiety. So like Ver said, and those type of drugs um, are going to be given to help keep the patient calm. So we don't want the patient to move around a lot or to have uh, any sort of activity. So a lot of times it will sedate these patients so that they're still and their brain can rest and heal. So when we talk about our um, interventions, these 
things will make more sense of why we want to keep them so sedated. So now we're getting into the specific type of nursing care that you're going to give. And our goal is to decrease the intracranial pressure. We want that pressure to be lower than 15 millimeters of mercury. We also want our Glasgow Coma Scale to be greater than nine. So seven and below is someone who needs to be intubated and, and um, they're pretty much in coma. So we want them to be greater than nine. So our goal is to decrease intracranial pressure. So the way we do that is do our neuro checks to assess for changes in their level of consciousness and their motor function. So it includes uh, eye opening, the motor function, and a verbal response to you speaking to them. So we can review the Glasgow Coma Scale on, on another video. But so we'll do neuro checks to assess your level of consciousness. We're gonna monitor for worsening conditions. Next, we'll keep the head of the bed no more than 30 degrees because if you go higher, the higher you go up, the more gravity pulls down and the higher the pressure goes inside the skull. So we want to keep them, their head of their bed low at around 30 degrees. So no higher than 30 degrees. No coughing or straining. So coughing and straining increases the pressure inside the skull. So we have to do things like, um, we have, they can't cough, so we'll give whatever medications we need to give to prevent them from doing that sort of stuff. So maybe some sedation may help. So we want to prevent straining. So with straining, that's gonna be stools and bowel movements. Um, they may not have very good bowel function at, when they're sick like this in the hospital, but we will provide stool softeners. So if you get it, come across the NCLEX question and what kind of medications may you give, you may choose stool softeners as well because it will help uh, decrease any sort of straining they may have. A cooling blanket because we don't want their temperature to be up. So if their temperature is a little bit on the cool side, that's definitely way better than it being on the warmer side. So cooling blanket to maintain uh, a lower body temperature so that we're not into hyperthermia and a quiet environment. So any sort of stimulus is not good for the patient who has increased intracranial pressure. So we want to decrease the sensations around them. So you'll see oftentimes posted like quiet, um, no visitors or minimal visitors that don't talk around the patient. So you're not like stimulating them a lot. So it need to have a very quiet, soothing environment. Um, next, we will watch for cerebral spinal fluid leaks. So how do we know that that's happening? Well, you'll look for fluid coming out of their nose or their ears, and that will tell us if there's leaking fluid. So cerebral spinal fluid is clear, and it's hard to tell if it's drainage, you know, just nasal drainage or whatnot. Now, we don't usually have clear fluid coming out of our ears, but what you can do is take a piece of gauze and you dab it, and then if it is cerebral spinal fluid, it'll make this halo effect on the gauze. So you can look at that in my PowerPoint slide to see what that looks like. So safety also is seizure precautions. Remember these patients are prone to having seizures or posturing, and then we want to provide seizure, seizure precautions before it happens. So padding the side rails, um, preventing the patient from injury, those type of things. Now let's look at some more nursing care things that we need to do. With respiratory care, remember these patients may be on the ventilator. And if they're on the ventilator, we have to have special precautions because we don't want to suction too much. So we want to limit suctioning because as we suction, we stimulate the patient to cough. So that's something we don't want the patient to do. So we're only gonna do it if, if absolutely necessary. The next thing is keeping their oxygen saturation above 92%. So we want to keep them in that normal range. 92 is kind of low for normal, but it's okay if they're on a ventilator and they're being watched. 
So PaCO2, their carbon dioxide level is 30 to 35. Remember, they may have to need hyperventilation. So if you see that the patient's CO2 levels are going up too much, then they may need like a respiratory therapist to come and adjust their levels to maintain that normal carbon dioxide level. So remember, an increase in their carbon dioxide levels also increases the intracranial pressure because it causes vasodilation. The next thing is uh, INO and nutritional status. So intake and output is extremely important. We want to measure that. So we're gonna give isotonic fluids. They'll get normal saline or LR. Those are both like normo type fluids, okay, isotonic. Mannitol is that osmotic diuretic that we're gonna give and it will increase urine output. So that's something we hope to see. That's an expected outcome of mannitol. So don't forget that expected outcome of mannitol, the osmotic diuretic that inhibits sodium reabsorption. We want it to produce more urine. So we want more output in order to keep that systolic blood pressure lower and that will help decrease pressure in the brain. They will get an NG tube to decompress the stomach. So as they're under this huge amount of stress, the body parts that the body doesn't necessarily need, is not as important as the brain, is the GI tract. So the GI tract slows down and they're not gonna be eating and we need to keep the stomach empty. We don't want their stomach to inflate full of bile and gases and then that can cause nausea and vomiting in and of itself. So we want to keep the stomach empty and we'll decompress it with an NG tube hooked to low intermittent suction depending on the orders and we will do that. With NG tube and the fact that the patient is under a large amount of stress into the body causes the acid to, in the stomach to increase, which can cause GI ulcers really fast. So we want to protect the GI lining and we'll give a Pepsid to prevent stress ulcers. And you'll also see a Pantoprazole or Protonix is a very common one they like to give to help decrease a pressure ulcers in the stomach. Uh, not pressure ulcers, but stress ulcers in the stomach. Um, we want to check for bowel sounds and give stool softener. So remember that the bowel kind of slows down and we want to assess the bowel sounds, you know, see if they're working. And then we want to give stool softener so that there's no straining that will increase pressure. Now they may, after a while, after the initial trauma is over and they're starting to uh, re recuperate from their injuries, then they may start them on feeds. It's usually gonna take at least, if they've been really sick, they're gonna wait at least seven days before they start them on uh, enteral nutrition. So they may get an NG tube for tube feedings or TPN. And at the very severe cases, they may even get a PEG tube at one time to give feedings until they're completely healed. Because they're gonna be NPO at this point until they're um, able to have regular intracranial pressure and sit up and eat. Now, the other things we're gonna worry about is bed-bound patients' problems. So that sedentariness, um, turn every two hours, now they're sedentary and they're intubated and we can't do the whole turn, cough, deep breathing to prevent pneumonia, but we can still turn them every two hours to prevent ulcers, uh, pressure ulcers, and turn really slow. So remember that technically these patient, patients, we wanna keep them midline straight and still. Midline straight and still. But they do have to relieve the pressure off of their joints um, every now and then. So we will try to keep their head still and we'll just shift their body a little bit and tuck some pillows underneath. And every two hours we'll shift their body weight. A lot of times they're on those beds that do the automatic turning and that's ideal for those patients to be on.